You wrote a paper on exercise induced orgasm. Oh, that is a fun one. Let's yeah. talk about that because I haven't talked about that on my platform yet. And I think it is a very interesting phenomenon. It's fascinating. It is fascinating. Yes. Yeah, so somewhere close to 10% of Americans um, have experienced at least one exercise induced orgasm in their lives. And um, we've published a few studies on this. It kind of drives me crazy that there's not more research on there's this. There's like very little. I think it's like yours is like one of the only, only papers, right? I don't think it's I've seen us. another paper on it. No, and like, and, and I've done a lot of like kind of innovative, like early stage stuff that gets other people excited and then they follow suit and do it too. And nobody's ever followed suit on this. And I just keep hoping like, isn't, doesn't anyone else find this as intriguing or interesting? It's fascinating. So I hear from people all the time about their experiences with exercise induced orgasm. So I've done research. I did publish a book some years ago called The Corgasm Workout. I find it fascinating. And I think I hear from people because I'm one of the only people who's researched it. But it's such an interesting way that the body works. When we started studying it, we thought it was only women because that's kind of who was represented in popular culture about it. But very quickly when our first study came out, like the emails poured in from all over the world because like the study got picked up by media everywhere. So I was getting, I was having to use Google Translate a lot to like translate people's emails. So I understood them. And we heard from a lot of men. And so we've since published um, research involving men too. And, you know, what's interesting about them to me, I mean, there's a lot of things, but they don't usually have like erections when they have their exercise induced orgasm. They go from flaccid or very, very slightly erect Correct. penises to ejaculation. So, and those who have experience with prostate stimulation, which isn't a lot of them, but those who do will say it feels a lot more like a prostate orgasm than the orgasms I would get like through my penis, through intercourse. So they're ejaculating, they're not just orgasming. They're, they're doing... ejaculating. Really? Yeah. Which is really difficult for the males because it is then messier and it's and so it's very tricky when it happens in public so i said oh it's a really fun topic well it is and it isn't it's really fun mostly for i would say quite a lot of the women and it's really complicated for the men so when the men can't control it and it's like in a public space like for example i think of like a, a professional male gymnast mm -hmm. you know who i heard from and that was very tricky for him right he has to wear tight clothing like leotards for his you know for unitars leotards and he's a it professional, is. Gymnast. professional gymnast Holy and God. there are certain aspects of his you know his training routine that would cause him to ejaculate not all the time but it was uncontrollable so that was really really difficult for him you know i've heard from quite a few men who are in the service really difficult for them now it got better since the army got rid of their sit-up speed test but when they had a sit-up speed test there were some men who were failing the sit-up speed test because i mean i heard from like army physicians who were trying to like help some of their their people get through some of the the training that they had to do and so a challenge is that we don't fully understand the mechanisms, yeah. which again, for those researchers out there who want to study this, I think there's a lot more to learn because there are some people who really, really would like to better control it. Even though for the, the women, it's much more often, you know, invisible to others. So those who do enjoy it feel like they have the room to enjoy it. It's still not enjoyable for everyone. Yeah. And so, and we talk about that, like in the Corgasm Workout, I say, look, not everyone wants to have one of these, but some people do. And some people just want to experience the arousal, even if, even if you don't have an orgasm. But, um, you know, there is like a, you know, somebody I heard from whose daughter was a, like a college athlete. She's a runner and her college scholarship is for running. But part of her running workout, she was sometimes having orga like the orgasms and the exercise and just orgasms, and they got in the way of her training. So that is not only an exercise issue for her and a training issue, but it also gets into like her college scholarship issue. Like if she can't do this and compete, what does that mean for her ability to stay a student athlete? So can people train themselves to get these orgasms versus tr train themselves not to? Yeah, so we're working on that. I mean, I will say that I've, I've had a lot of nice one-on-one -on -one emails with people who are trying not to. Mm -hmm. And for some of them, we can find ways not to. For some, it's easy enough where it's like it's one particular thing that does it. They just take that out of their workout. I mean, they, they can't find a way to do that thing. And so it just says, or they can find a way, but they, they have to kind of be aware of at what point is like the tipping point mm -hmm. that will cause the orgasm. So they can say, oh, like, I mean, there are some people who are like light clockwork on the eighth or ninth unassisted Rep. pull up. This yeah. will happen. So I'm 
going to do that when it's when I feel like it. But when I don't feel like it, like if I'm working out with a trainer, let's say I'm going to stop at six just to be safe. Um, and how do you tell your trainer? You know, you're like, oh, I can only do up, six, right? right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, some people say like, you know, my trainer gets upset with me. So I've tried to do some outreach to like, really to like personal trainers and folks in kinesiology and exercise science, because I have heard from trainers who said, wow, like I've now wonder, like, did any of my clients have this? And did I push them too far, too hard to do something that they didn't want to do for this reason? When I, maybe I thought they just weren't like willing to work hard. You know, maybe this is a reason some clients haven't come back when I've pushed them in some areas, right? Because people don't always want to tell their trainer what's happening with their bodies. Do we think it's a friction issue or do we think it's a pelvic floor activation that's causing? Probably neither. Neither. Yeah, we don't know. But there was a little bit of research. It's one of my big research regrets that we never got to, to go further with this. But there is some sense that like it could be like an issue of like different types of development, like ways you've developed one side versus the other side of your core abdominal muscles. So I was getting much more into like a deep dive on this exercise induced orgasm stuff when I realized rough sex and choking were were taking off. And I and I mean, to be honest, I just had to kind of switch and turn my attention to what felt like a really urgent public health issue. So I do hope to return one day to the exercise induced orgasm, but um, research, but most people will tell us that it does not feel like a friction thing to them. I mean, some people will say, oh, sure. Like if I'm wearing compression shorts, it's it's more likely. But mostly they will say it's very internal. It's very deep. Some people will describe, which is probably more of a hormonal association, like a tingling down their core. I don't even remember, you know, some of the, the issues that I had connected with other people in different fields who were like, oh, I know what hormone it is when you feel this type of vertical tingling. Apparently, it's a very specific thing that I don't remember. But it is fun and pleasurable for many people. The Corgasm Workout book wasn't about teaching people to have a corgasm specifically because we haven't we didn't find that we could for the most part. Yeah. But we did find that like you could help people adjust their exercise routine in ways that they experience greater arousal. And the reason that could be beneficial is so that you could on your own learn how to sort of maneuver your body in ways that you could kind of enhance and embrace your own arousal, even just in sex, right? So Mm. we did have people who we interviewed who were like, you know, a nice benefit of like the fact that I just naturally, right, have these exercise induced orgasms is that now I know how to manipulate my core And I've been able to like experience orgasm more regularly during intercourse. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. Like they're like, I can do these like micro movements or tension or just be like more like a for some, it's like a body position, like a way that they just kind of hold their torso differently, Mm -hmm. that they can have more arousal even and just be kind of in the mood during sex. I would love if people watching this on YouTube could leave some comments below if they feel comfortable about their experience because this is fascinating. I think, yes, someone should research this. It is fascinating and and could be beneficial in, in the, yeah. the way you're describing to learn your body and to be able to utilize that to have better orgasms more readily when you're with your partner or by yourself or whatever, right? But but at the end of the day, like being able to use that information could be extremely valuable. And then there's people who are struggling. I mean, that sounds horrible and, and certainly pay attention to to, I guess what I'm taking away is pay attention to what is causing it and and step back around that or try to figure out what yeah. movement is causing it and try to work your way around that. Yep, absolutely. Is there something else that you think we should cover today that we haven't talked about? I mean, there's so much we could talk there's about. There's always a million There's things. so many things, but I think other, maybe more positive or exciting things that we can end on. Yeah, you know, I think when it comes to kids, you know, when it comes to kids, teenagers, young adults, I mean, and we talked a lot about the tough parts of parenting. But I do want to encourage parents, like, think about what you want for your kids, right? And common things parents will say is, I want them to have, like, healthy relationships. I want them to, like, experience love, you know, if they want it. I want them to feel comfortable with their own bodies and not ashamed by their own bodies. I want them to, like, feel like they can talk about sex with their partners, with their healthcare providers one day. Like, all these things, like their bodies and stuff. So so if you kind of think about what you want for them, for me as a parent and as a professional, it helps to think about how you get there, Mm -hmm. right? And like, if you you want your kids to know accurate terms for their bodies, start reading them age-appropriate kids' books, you know, at the, you know, like, 
like amazing you is a really fun one. And, you know, if you want them to have good boundaries around their bodies, there's nice ones like it's my body, what I say Mm -hmm. goes. And so start those because not only do they give your kids a resource, but as a parent, especially when they're really little, you get some practice saying those things out loud and you get some practice having these conversations and building a really, really healthy, trusting relationship with your child so they know they can talk with you about boundaries, about consent, about their their bodies, about love, about relationships, about how babies are made. And just keep growing that, right? I mean, keep the door open. If you react in a way that you wish you hadn't reacted and you shame them or you blame them or you get upset, think about like what it, you know. a lot of people call rupture and repair. So you have that moment and then you come back later and you say, I'm really sorry that I reacted the way that I did the other day. Let's try that again. Yeah. And then you you also, you're modeling and you're showing them that in relationships, we make mistakes sometimes, but we can reconnect. Yes. I do that all the time because I yeah. make mistakes all the time. We all do. We right? all do. Um, I do want to talk about one more thing that we didn't talk about. So in this setting of rising rough sex, we also know, and one of your very popular studies showed that young people are having less sex. You know, I think we don't know exactly why that is, but what are your thoughts on why that is and and what should we be concerned about? I mean, I think there's lots of reasons, you know, that fewer people are having partnered sex these days. And we're seeing that around the country. We found that in the US, but others have found that in the UK and Japan and Sweden too. So there's probably a few things. One, I do think that some of it has to do with the rise of rough sex because I hear from young people, you know, I've only had one hookup experience or one sexual experience and I started making out with somebody and they started like, hitting me and slapping me and calling me names and this doesn't feel good. So I think there's probably some small percentage of young people who are opting out because they've had some negative experiences. I think there's another tiny percent of people, but still a very important percent of people who feel a lot more comfortable with asexual identification than did 20 years ago. And even if that's just half percent or 1% of people, all of these different things add up to an overall population decline in partnered sex. So, you know, more people saying, hey, like, I don't really feel attraction toward other people and I'm okay with that. And like, so that's great, right? So that like, we wanna support people developing what feels right for them. I think there's also, as we all know, people are spending a whole lot more time on their devices. And it doesn't account for everything, but it does for some. I think many of us who have lived long enough had said, yeah, 20 years ago, no, you just went to bed. You didn't get into your bed and like doom scroll, you know, and and things like that. And then also around technology, we all like most of us, not all, we most of us stream a lot more shows. So if I think back to like, you know, before you had like all the streaming shows that you do now and you had to like wait, you know, for Thursday night to see your show or Sunday night. Or watch a commercial that was longer than 30 seconds. You just didn't spend as much time in front of your TV as I think it can be easy to do when like your a new season of your favorite show drops and now you and your partner might watch like five to 10 hours of TV that week. So I think sometimes just, you know, remembering that for those of us who you know, want to have a really pleasurable, high quality sex life with, and most people actually either want about the kind of sex they're having or a little bit more. There's not as usually as many people who are like, no, a lot less, but some do. But if you want a little more, you know, think about where you can make space for it, where you can decrease stress in your life, where you can focus on connection with your partner, where you can build trust and kindness with your partner. But you also need that time, like away from so much social media, so much streaming, so much stuff that kind of just grabs your attention so that you can focus on one another. Do you think it's even before you're in relationships where like you're so, I guess, feeling satisfied that you can get, and this is one of my theories, is that you can get porn, you can watch porn, you can feel sexually aroused and you can ejaculate an orgasm much more easily by yourself and you don't have to then go up to someone and speak to them and ask them out and get rejected or deal with those sort of challenges that come with courting and trying to date someone and get them to have sex with you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly possible, you know, and I one thing that many, many college professors who teach human sexuality here these days is also kind of along those lines, you're talking about problems with courtship and stuff, is we hear a lot of young people say, I don't even know how to date. Like, I literally don't know. They'll say, I don't know what you're supposed to say when you ask somebody out. 
I don't know if you do get somebody to go to lunch with you or dinner with you, like, what do you say when you're together? So they're really looking for a script. Hmm. And I've heard from a lot of parents of teenagers who say, wow, I'm kind of surprised that my 16 year old's not dating. They're just kind of late. They feel like they're late. But no, we're seeing a, an overall delay than it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. It's not just a pandemic thing. It was starting already. And so kids really don't have a lot of experience connecting with each other away from devices. Again, I think if we can delay a lot of device use and once they have it, try to limit where possible and not just by rules, but asking kids, like, how do you feel when you're on your phone or device? Like, you know, and making sure they get experience having face-to-face contact with other kids their age and then supporting them with like literally telling them sometimes the things that you say when you're getting to know people and even looking for positive shows. Like I think the Heartbreaker show was a really nice teen drama. Never Have I Ever was a really nice one too that showed like some real conversations about like talking to like someone you have a crush on or talking when things end and also showing how those conversations can be super awkward when you're like in 10th grade and they get more mature when you're in 12th grade. Yeah. And so... And even your thoughts around it change, right? Yeah. That was kind of cool in that that one. Yeah. 